Now we move into fixed axis rotation. What this means is that you, uh, you have something which is rotating, but um, it's rotating about a point that is fixed. This is different from, for instance, if you kick a ball and it can rotate at the same time that it's, it's moving, um, that it has translational motion, that's a much more complicated problem. So we start with fixed axis rotation. And what I want to emphasize here, so a lot of you guys who are in introductory college physics, uh, introductory, inter introductory university physics, have seen physics before. And up until this point, it might have been relatively easy because you have seen this in high school. This is the point when I'm teaching a large group of students where I start to see the students who had, high school, had a good high school physics class, their physics class got, they, they handled collisions, they handled uh, projectile motion, but they, if they had rotation, it wasn't very good or they didn't get it as well. So this is the point in the semester when a lot of students start to, at least, maybe, if not struggle, before it might have been smooth sailing because you've seen it before, and now it starts to get tricky. Um, usually, you're less familiar. It's, it's harder to think about what's going on with rotations. So if the class so far has been relatively easy for you, I encourage you to, you're on notice. I'm putting you on notice that it gets harder now for the vast majority of students because this is not something you're as comfortable with. So we're gonna start with defining coordinate systems and terminology. Now, when I'm teaching physicists, physicists do not like memorization and will often do many things to avoid memorizing a formula. You know, physicists will rederive a whole bunch of stuff to avoid having memorized one equation. They'll spend a half a page rederiving the equation. There are some times when it is worth sucking it up and memorizing equations and memorizing terminology. And I encourage you to do that with, with a few of the terms here. So if I'm telling you that you have to memorize something or that you should memorize something, you should take that advice because I do not like memorizing. I am not good at it. I don't want to do it, but sometimes it is necessary. Okay, when you have a particle following a circular path, we follow the convention. Note that math textbooks may use a slightly different convention. We, have, we use the angle theta um, to mean the angle up from the x-axis. So if you're describing a point along the x-axis, it can be described by a point r and theta instead of using x and y. Uh, this is called polar coordinates. Uh, and so theta is the angle up from the x-axis. r, the vector r, is the position vector. We also use the lowercase r to indicate its distance from the origin. And in this chapter, we are going to use the origin as the fixed axis. We consider positive theta, therefore, to be um, increasing, uh, so rotating counterclockwise. When it does this, it sweeps out an a, a, a distance s uh, a, a called the arc length. So that is the length along the circumference of the circle. Arc length can be related to theta. So this s, the arc length, is equal to the distance from the x axis or distance from the origin times theta. We then use a, a little bit more terminology. Omega is the angular um, is the angular speed, and this is d theta d t. The radial speed is then the distance along the, the circle. The radial speed is equal to the time derivative of the arc length. So for a fixed, um, for a fixed radius, this is r d theta d t or r omega. 
This has units of hertz or inverse seconds, except that we usually denote it radians per second. Radians are a unitless quantity. So technically, this is inverse seconds, which is also known as hertz. Keeping the radians there is a way of keeping track of the fact that we're using, for instance, radians versus degrees, making sure things cancel out nicely. This is different from the frequency. Um, omega equals 2 pi f. So the frequency, if you have something rotating around a, a circle, the frequency is the number of rotations per second. The angular frequency is the number of radians per second. It's 2 pi times the number of, of cycles per second. The period is equal to 1 over the frequency. So the period is the amount of time it takes for one cycle, and therefore it's inversely proportional to the, the number of cycles per second. Okay, this, all this, this is worth searing into your brain because it will come up later, in this chapter even. If you get an equation sheet, then go ahead and write some of these equations on your equation sheet. Even if you don't get an equation sheet with an exam, I would, it is a good idea to keep a running list of all of the equations that you're likely to actually need, along with some explanation of when you can use them. Okay, the angle vector, ah yes, the angle vector points along the z-axis and the position vector and the arc length bo both lie in the xy plane. This forms our, our coordinate system in polar coordinates. In physics, we always need a right-handed orthogonal coordinate system. So your three coordinates are r, theta, your coordinates are r and theta, and then here you have a position s along the, the arc, so r, theta, and s. If you are looking down the circle, so x, y, and let's see, here I have to be careful. This, uh, these videos are, you're actually seeing the mirror image of what I do, so my right hand looks like your left hand. So when I do R cross X, to me it looks like it should be pointing this way, but actually you're seeing, you want me to do R, sorry, R cross Y, it would be pointing towards you, is Z. Okay, so, and also be aware, you're looking at the mirror image, so the coordinate system that you see here is left-handed. So I should switch my X and my Y, and you will see a right-handed coordinate system. If this is your X and this is your Y. So I go, so X cross Y is Z. Now I have to use my left hand for the right-hand rule. Okay, so then when you have, uh, so here, if you have some point here, you have a position vector r. That's one of your uh, unit vectors. S, so s points in this direction. That means that s hat points in this direction. r hat points in this direction. And theta hat points along the z-axis. What this means is in your polar coordinate system, wherever you are, different points in that coordinate system all have different unit vectors. So the unit vectors change. That means that you have to be careful when you're working with unit vectors because the unit vectors are not the same everywhere. 
If you continue on to upper division mechanics, you will confront some of the complications that that introduces, but mostly in this class, we are going to avoid it because we're going to um, be dealing with, you know, if you're dealing with motion at a constant speed, then you're, you can fudge over it. Okay, two particles on a rotating disk have different tangential speeds depending on their distance to the axis of rotation. So we have uh, the, the speed is equal to the radius times d theta dt, or the radius times the angular frequency. So what that means is that the, um, the speed tangential to the arc is dependent on the radius. So if you are, if you are on a merry-go-round spinning quickly, if you're near the edge, your tangential speed is a lot larger than if you are at the, if you are near the center. All right. Because we're working with mirror images, we're going to just change the this is now the y axis and this is the x axis. For Okay, so for counterclockwise rotation in the coordinate system, the angular velocity points in the direction of the z-axis. So if you are rotating from x to y, that is in the, so theta is increasing. Line your, your palm up with x and rotate it towards y, and then your thumb points in the axis of rotation. That gives you the angular velocity vector. So angular velocity is actually a vector um, pointing perpendicular to the, uh, pointing along the axis of rotation, so perpendicular to the plane that is rotating. And you can get this with the right-hand rule. Um, so here, x cross y is equal to omega theta. Or curl your palm in the direction of rotation. Curl your palm in the direction of rotation, your thumb points along the angular velocity vector. Okay, so here you have three different vectors. You're rotating at constant speed. Again, we're going to do this trick because of the mirror image. This is y and this is x. So now, x cross y equals z. I have a right-handed coordinate system. And the um, when, now this has the angular velocity. If your angular velocity is pointing as drawn, then your, uh, if you curl with your rotation, uh, then You are, let's see if I do it right. Now, the way that you guys see this, actually, your angular velocity is down. Because you're looking at the negative, at the mirror image. So, you uh, rotate, ah, yeah, you rotate your palm in the direction of motion and your thumb points in the direction of the angular velocity. Go ahead and do this along with the video. Practice so that you get that direction of angular velocity correct. Okay, so you're looking at the mirror image. So you see clockwise rotation here, not counterclockwise. Um, and when you see clockwise rotation, um, when you see clockwise rotation and the rotation is increasing, then your angular velocity, so when you're, you see clockwise rotation, 
all the vectors are in the opposite direction here on my figures because of the mirror image. So if you have a clockwise rotation, your um, angular velocity is down. If it is increasing, your angular acceleration is down as well. If, you're, if you had angular rotation clockwise and then it is, um, it is slowing down, then your angular acceleration is going to be upwards. If you have rotation, uh, now you have angular rotation which is clockwise and decreasing. So if it's clockwise, then the angular velocity is down. And then if it is clockwise and increasing, the angular acceleration is up. Clockwise and decreasing, the angular acceleration is, or sorry, clockwise and increasing, the angular acceleration is down. Clockwise and decreasing, the angular acceleration is up. The angular acceleration points in the direction of the rotation that you are trying to make with whatever force you're applying. Okay, we're gonna. So, some examples. A wind turbine is rotating clockwise, um, as seen from head on. So, you guys see this rotating clockwise. Fishing line coming off of a rotating reel moves linearly. Um, so, then if you have a constant angular, uh, so if it moves uh, linearly and it is um, unwinding at a constant speed, your, uh, your theta is changing with a, constant, um, with a constant angular velocity omega and the, um, and it, if it's moving at a constant angular speed, alpha is equal to zero. Here you can see, the, an ex, as an example, a graph, per, for instance, of an angular velocity of a propeller versus time. This is, uh, so angular velocity omega, and here you can write omega equals omega naught plus alpha t. So it is deep. You can see that the, um, this has a negative slope, so alpha is negative. And that tells you that the, um, the propeller is slowing down. And here, uniform circular motion. Um, if you have centripetal acceleration, the vector is, the, the acceleration points inward towards the axis of rotation. Um, in this case, if it's uniform, there is no tangential acceleration, but if you are speeding up or slowing down, you have both um, centripetal acceleration as well as tangential acceleration. So you have acceleration tangential to the, um, to the, um, the rotation. And that is going to be, um, that's what indicates whether you speed up or slow down in the ten, uh, tangentially. So whether or not something moving here is going to speed up or slow down. Uniform versus non-uniform. So if you have a particle which is accelerating, remember that acceleration can be either positive or negative, so it can either be speeding up or slowing down, and it has angular acceleration, the total acceleration is the vector sum of those two accelerations. Um, so you can actually have a particle moving in a circle whose acceleration is not directly pointed towards the center of the circle. Um, and this is showing, uh, likewise, if you have a small change in the acceleration, then, um, then you have a vector, a centripetal, your total acceleration is close to the centripetal acceleration. When you're reading these figures on the YouTube video, because the image is flipped, every time you see clockwise, change it to counterclockwise and vice versa.
Okay, moments of inertia. Last chapter, we introduced the concept of a center of mass, and the center of mass means that you can treat the object when you're talking about, say, momentum, thing, collisions, um, objects flying in projectile motion. You can treat it as if it is a point particle located at one point called the center of mass. When we have rotational um, motion, we have something similar conceptually. We have a, a moment of inertia, which is a way of measuring how much, you know, where the mass is around the circle. Um, so that something that has a larger moment of inertia, um, this is also, this is somewhat analogous to a mass, something that has a larger moment of inertia is harder to get rotating, just like something with a larger mass is harder to get, um, it's harder to get it to speed up. So the definition of the moment of inertia, if you have point particles, is the, the sum of the masses um, times the, the positions of the masses. Note that we're not dividing by some total mass. Um, if, it's, if it's point particles, this is what we do. This distance is the distance from the axis. It is not the, necessarily the position vector. We have inherently assumed that you are rotating about um, that you are rotating about the origin. If you have different coordinate systems, then so that you're not rotating about uh, if you're not rotating about the center of the object, you have to consider something. Um, you have to consider that shift. If you consider uh, extended objects, then your moment of inertia is the integral of r squared times a small unit of, of mass. You can write that small unit of mass as the, the volume density, or uh, I forget what the standard notation is for the standard variable. You can have a volume density, you can have an area density, or you can have a linear density. If you have a density per unit area, you integrate over the area. If you have a density per unit length, you have um, an integral over the length. So this would actually require a triple integral, a double integral, or a single integral, depending on, um, on your object. So the first step in calculating a moment of inertia for an extended object is usually to figure out how you write the small unit of mass. And as with the center of mass, sometimes there's some tricks that help you sim write simpler integrals, but sometimes it's actually easier to write a triple integral than to, um, than to, write, down, to write down the correct triple integral and then just do a triple integral rather than to write out a simpler one-dimensional integral but risk that you write it down wrong. Okay, so here, Six washers are spaced 10 centimeters apart on a rod of negligible mass and rotating about a vertical axis. So I'm going to call these particles one, two, three, four, five, and six. And now I'm going to calculate the moment of inertia about this axis. Note, of course, if I rotated about this axis instead of this axis, I would have a totally different um, moment of inertia. All right, so now we're going to use the moment of inertia is equal to the sum of the masses times their distances from the axis of rotation squared. So for particle one, it is, uh, and we're just going to write, we'll just leave the mass as m. So for particle one, it is 25 centimeters from the axis of rotation. So this is 25 quantity squared. For particle two, it is 15 centimeters from the axis squared. For particle three, it is five centimeters. For particle four, it is also five 
centimeters. Particle five is 15 centimeters. And particle six is 25 centimeters. And you would have to have a mass to get a number, you would have to have a mass for the mass of the washer, and you would have to have, a, um, and then you would, it would have units, whatever units you put this distance in. So I did not do this in SI. If I wanted to do it in SI, I would have to add some decimal points. So what you can see here is that the, the, num the particles, that the washers that contribute most to the moment of inertia are these way out here. If you want to get something spinning rapidly, it's harder to do, it's harder to get something spinning if its mass is toward the edge than if its mass is toward the, towards the center. Now, if you did it about the other axis, if you did it about this axis, then the distance of each of those particles, each of those washers from the, you're, we're modeling them as point particles. So the distance of each of those washers from the center of the axis is approximately zero. So your moment of inertia would be much smaller about the axis that they sit on than um, about the rod that they're on than, about, than perpendicular to that, um, to that rod. So if you think about that, so it's harder to turn something when its mass is toward the outside. So this is why if you are, um, if you do turns when you're skating, if you have your arms out, it's, it's harder to get turning. And then as you pull your arms in, you, you actually speed up. Okay, so these are, this table is in your book. This is a table of centers of masses of different objects. Um, those are all done. Um, those are all calculated using some variation of this. So a triple integral over the entire object. Um, sometimes, and then there's a, theorem so that you can shift the axis of rotation. Um, so if you wanted to double check your understanding of each, how to calculate the moments of inertia, which this is not, a, this is a class which has calculus as a co-requisite, not a prerequisite. If you're already comfortable with calculus, you can go ahead and calculate some of those moments of inertia and test your understanding. You also can look these up. So sometimes when you're doing problems, you can take advantage of this table. If you have another relatively straightforward object, um, there are a bunch of tables out on the internet that you can look up. Um, you can look up what the moment of inertia of a bunch of different objects are. And fortunately, physics is one of those subjects where if you're looking up basic introductory physics um, knowledge, the internet is basically right. You don't have to worry about people purposefully saying wrong things on the internet about intro physics. Now, I said, so we were so far talking about the center of mass, about uh, the origin. If you have an object and you are rotating it about something other than its own center of mass, you can actually calculate what its moment of inertia is using the parallel axis theorem. So if I pick an object, let me pick one of the ones off of this table. I have a solid sphere. Um, and I am rotating it about its center. So for a solid sphere um, about its center, the moment of inertia is 2m r squared over 5. So now, instead of rotating it about its center, I'm going to shift it here so that it is so we're going to rotate the sphere around so it's not lined up with the center. And this is a distance r. I'm going to rotate it on one of its ends. Instead of the center of, instead of the moment of inertia that you had about its center, 
the moment of inertia about a point on the end is going to be the moment of inertia of, about the center of mass. plus m r squared, because we're a distance of r from the center of mass. So that is going to be 7 fifths m r squared. Note that you have to, if you're using some of these moments of inertia that you look up in a table, read the table very carefully, because the table will often include say, a sphere about a point on its end or a sphere about its own center of mass. When you look up the centers, the moments of inertia of, say, rods, you can rotate, rotate them about their center of mass, end on end, about their center of mass around the center. Read the table carefully and make sure you understand the configuration because this is, because reading the table incorrectly is a common source of mistakes. So here you have a barbell um, with an axis of rotation through its center. So you have your two weights here and you're rotating it like this. Um, or you're holding weights and you decide to spin. Um, that will have a moment of inertia. That will have one moment of inertia. Um, here we can actually approximate the moment of inertia. We can actually calculate these in two different ways. So. moment of inertia of the first one about so about its center of mass is we're going to treat each of these masses as one mass at a distance r so it is m r squared plus m r squared or 2 m r squared that's the moment of inertia for this configuration for this configuration I can use my parallel axis theorem. I equals the moment of inertia about the center of mass. So now here, I am, if I'm carrying two, if I'm holding two barbells, now I'm rotating about one of my hands instead of the, um, instead of the center. So that is 2mr squared. That's my moment of inertia about the center of mass plus the distance. So the total mass, which is 2m quantity, the distance from the center of mass. Now this guy, the distance of the center of mass from the axis is R. So 2m capital R squared. This gives me 4m R squared. Of course, I can also calculate this the same way we did this one. And then I treat it as two point particles. This first mass has a radius of zero from the axis of rotation, so it contributes nothing to the moment of inertia. The second mass contributes m times 2r quantity squared, or 4mr squared. So here I solved this problem in two different ways, got the same answer. Sometimes when I'm particularly stumped by a problem and I'm worried that I'm making a bunch of dumb mistakes, I like to go back and solve the same problem in two different ways in order to make sure that I really understand it inside and out. It's not a bad thing to do when you're getting started. I recognize that that takes a lot of time and often you're just struggling to figure out how to do the problem one way. What you can do, however, is work with a friend. Um, I always encourage study groups in my class and naturally multiple people will choose people will choose to do the problem differently and if you choose to do the problem differently you have a way to cross check that you get the same answer here you have a disk with a radius r um, a distance l from the center so here we can go back to our table 
a disc with a radius R and these are spheres, discs. Uh, well, this one I remember. So the moment of inertia about the, so I center of mass for a, ah, so this is sphere, not a, uh, no, sorry. We'll do this one for a disc. It is one half m r squared. So if you instead rotate it um, about an axis, right, so this distance l is not quite the distance from the axis of rotation to the center of mass. That that distance is l plus r like this. So then our moment of inertia about this point A is equal to the moment of inertia about the center of mass plus the mass of the object times the distance squared from the of the center of mass from the axis of rotation. So 1 half mr squared plus m times l plus r squared. So I have 3 halves m r squared plus m l squared plus 2 m l r. When you're doing a problem like this, note that these all have, so you always have mass times distance squared. Often, when you're working things through, you will make stupid algebra mistakes. You can check that at least your answer has the right units um, by just counting distances and masses. Now, that will get you, that will catch, catch your wrong answers every time. It will catch most of your wrong answers because most of the time, if you're going to make a mistake, you're going to make a big one. Um, so I would recommend watching those units. Note that I could only really look at those units because I kept everything as a variable until the very end. All right, now we have spheres. Um, and you have uh, a sphere similar to the disk. Now we have to go back here. Our sphere's moment of inertia is, um, is 2 fifths mr squared. So here, my I center of mass is 2 fifths mr squared. Now my distance is again L plus R. So my total moment of inertia is 2 fifths m r squared plus m l plus r quantity squared. And I will leave simplifying as an exercise for the student. All right. Now we have the moment. So calculate the moment of inertia for a child on a merry-go-round um, here you are assuming that the child is at one meter. So we're going to say that the merry-go-round has a mass, capital M. The merry-go-round is a lot smaller than the child. The child has a mass of M. Now, we can calculate the moment of inertia as the sum of the moments of inertia of different objects. So the moment of inertia, we're going to model the merry-go-round as a disk. So the moment of inertia of a disk is 1 half m r squared. And then the child is at a distance where this is the radius of the disk. The child is, at a, 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 is halfway along the merry-go-round. So she adds 1 half m r over 2 quantity squared. So if you have if you have a more complicated object, you can calculate its total moment of inertia by adding the moments of inertia of different parts uh, relative to the axis you're rotating around. Again, do be careful when reading these tables for moments of inertia because it's easy to misread the table 
and pluck something for the moment, pluck out something that's the moment of inertia about something else. Okay, using the parallel axis theorem, what is the moment of inertia of the rod of mass m about the axis shown below? So if we use the parallel axis theorem, then we need to actually know the moment of inertia of a rod about its, so we'll go back here, we're going to pluck out a rod, ah, thin rod about axis through the center is m uh, l squared over 12. So about the center, i center of mass is 1 12th m this one uses capital L, so M L squared. Now that moment of inertia is, or is our center of mass is here. This is at two sixths L, and I'm actually going to leave it as two sixths L because everything is in sixths there. So then our total moment of inertia is. 1 12th, actually, uh, we'll simplify it to a third. 1 12th ml squared plus 1 plus m times 1 third l quantity squared. So 1 12th plus 1 ninth. It is left as an exercise. I'll set the integral up for how you would solve this with an integral, um, and I'll leave it as an exercise for the student to complete that. So if you, um, you will need the linear density to do the integral. The linear density is just the mass times the length. And then to set up the integral, you want to integrate uh, the distance squared times the mass, and so we will use a small unit of mass as m over l dx, and we're going to integrate from x equals negative l over 6 to positive 5 l over 6. Here you go, from negative l over 6 to 5 L over 6. And then here, our distance from the axis is just x squared, m over l dx. So if you're already comfortable with calculus, you can go ahead and do this integral. And you should get the same answer that we did, that we got when we used the parallel axis theorem. Okay, so the parallel axis theorem can save you a lot of time because often there are problems in the book where you're asked to solve and find the moment of inertia for a complicated uh, object. If you have to do the integrals, it generally takes a little more time and it's a little more error prone to do and to set up and complete an integral properly than it is to just add two numbers together. So consider, just, consider using the parallel axis theorem whenever it would help. Remember, a good physicist is a lazy physicist. Don't work any harder than you have to. That said, sometimes it's more work to use the parallel axis theorem because it's more work to find something that you can use the parallel axis theorem with. All right, moving on to examples of integrating moments of inertia. And if you guys haven't actually done calculus yet, then go ahead and skip through this section and you can, um, you can review it later if it's useful, once you've had some calculus. Okay, so in principle, when we are calculating the moment of inertia by doing an integral, we can do it for an arbitrary shape as long as we can write out what a small unit of mass is, and we can integrate over that shape. 
The tricky part is usually writing the small unit of mass. So here we're going to do an example of a thin rod along uh, the x-axis. Uh, we Well, actually, let me keep that one up. Now we are going to write, um, so we will use the distance from the axis is now x, the, a small unit of mass is equal to the mass divided by the length times dx. And now we have to set our limits. We're going to integrate over the entire uh, length of the rod. So we are going to integrate from negative L over 2 to positive L over 2. X squared M over L dx. And that gives us M, L, M over L x cubed over 3 evaluated from negative L over 2 to positive L over 2. And this is M over L times L cubed over 24. When we cube x, so minus L, well, let me just write it, minus L over, minus a negative L over 2 quantity cubed, which is also, which is equal to a positive L cubed over 24. So we have 2 times L cubed over 24, or M over L, L cubed over 12 which is equal to m l squared over 12. So when we do this approach and we are integrating, oh, so we're integrating over an object, here shifting the axes, once you've got the integral set up, you might as well just change your integration limits, shift where your axis starts um, to wherever you want it to be. Um, but if you've already got the integral done, then it's easier to use the parallel axis theorem. Or, you can, better yet, you can do it using, um, you can figure out what you, your answer should be using the parallel axis theorem and double check by setting up the integral. Okay, now, it's a very similar integral. We are going to integrate, we're going to start at the beginning. The moment of inertia is equal to r squared dm. Now our r is equal to x. dm is equal to mass over total length dx. So the integral is the same. Now we're going to integrate from 0 to L. x squared m over L dx, and this is equal to m over l x cubed over 3 from 0 to l, or m l squared over 3. All right, a disk. Now, when we use, integrate over a disk, there's, a, there's multiple different ways to do this. The, the book guides you towards integrating over it as, uh, it, you know, as concentric circles. Um, I personally think it's easier to integrate over a plane um, and just do a double integral. Here, we're going to have the distance is equal to r. We're just going to have r equals r. Um, a small unit of mass is equal to the total mass divided by pi times the total radius squared. Um, so we're using r as the variable, little r as the variable of integration and capital R as the, as the total radius. 
So if we're going to set this up in um, as a double integral, then this is oh, sorry. This is our density per unit area, and then we can write in polar coordinates. Um, our distance is r squared uh, v r d theta, so that a small chunk of area out here is going to have this side is d r and this side is r d theta. So that's our small unit of mass. If we set this up as a if we set this up as a double integral, so our moment of inertia is equal to r squared m over pi capital R squared little r squared d r d theta. And then our integration over theta is from 0 to 2 pi. And we have no other theta dependence, so that's an easy integral to do. And our integration from r is over r is from 0 to capital R. The integral over theta um, gives us 2 pi. I'm going to pull our constants out in front. And we are left with an integral from 0 to capital R of R to the fourth dr. And then um, I can cancel out a, a pi already. Um, so I have the integral, uh, so I have 2m over capital R squared. And then I get r to the fifth over 5 from 0 to capital R. So this is 2m over r squared times capital R to the fifth over 5, which is equal to, let's see. I should have had, yeah, this has units of mass times distance. I added an extra r here. This is dr, this is r d theta. So I had an extra power of r here. And I'm going to go back and correct this. Sorry about that. What told me, by the way, that my answer was wrong is that I have the wrong units. What changes when you have a lot of experience is not the number of mistakes you mis make, it's how quickly you catch them. And what told me there that I had a mistake was that I had the wrong units. I had mass times radius cubed. That's not the right units for moment of inertia. OK, so now I have an, um, 2m capital R squared times r to the fourth over 4. So I have m r squared over 2. And that is indeed what I told you the moment of inertia of a disk is. Um, so I had better get the right answer. I'm going to do this integral in a different way um, so that you can see that I get the, the right answer either way. So now, this is how the book has points you to set it up, um, has it as uh, um, you're going to integrate concentric rings. So now your r is still going to equal r, and you're going to integrate from 0 to r, 0 to capital R. But now each ring is going to be, I like doing it, so your mass density per unit area times the area of the ring, and the ring has a width dr, and it has a circumference 2 pi r. So we have 2 pi r dr is the area. Um, and these are lowercase because the radius changes. Um, we need the radius to change as you move outward from the center.
So then you can set up your moment of uh, your integral for the moment of inertia. Now, because we only have one variable in this, um, we only have to integrate over little r. And I'm going to set this integral up as r squared. Now dm is capital M over r squared times 2 pi little r dr. I already have some cancellations because I have some pi's that I can cancel out. And I am left with, I'm going to pull my constants out in front, 2m over capital R squared. Oh, my integration limits are from 0 to R, to capital R. Integral from 0 to capital R. And here I have R cubed dr. So I get 2m over capital R squared, capital R to the fourth over 4, which is indeed equal to 1 half m r squared. So either way you do it, you get the same answer. I personally have always found it easier to set up triple integrals or double integrals than to figure out some than to, to figure out some clever way of doing the integration so that you only have to do a single integral. Double and triple integrals can look scary, but they aren't necessarily harder than, um, than single integrals. Okay, now we move to torque. Um, and bear with me here, this is reflected, so I'm having to do a little extra thought when I, when I think about um, how we write each of these equations. Torque is the analog of force. So, um, before, so our definition of torque is the cross product between the distance, uh, between uh, the cross product of the lever arm, and the force that is applied. So R cross F is equal to the torque. And so that is going to be pointing outward at you. R cross F is the torque. Um, just like we had force equals mass times acceleration, now we have torque equals moment of inertia times angular acceleration. So when you apply a torque, it, begin, it causes something to rotate. Just like when you apply a force, it causes something to accelerate. All right, so here you have a few different examples where you apply, so here you're applying a torque by pushing a door open. So, um, and, and this has a caption everywhere where you see counterclockwise, change it to clockwise and vice versa. Um, so here, if you push on this, uh, so now on this picture, your moment arm is the vector from the axis of rotation to where the force is applied. R cross F, line your, line your right hand up with R and rotate in the direction of the force. Remember, I can move the forces around, so I'm going to redraw the force there. R cross F is equal to the torque, so the torque is pointing at you. No matter where along the door's axis I move the, the force, I'm still going to have the torque pointing in the same direction. Of course, the moment arm is shorter here than it is here. Here, you no longer have the torque and the, and the moment arm. The, they're no longer perpendicular. So when you do R cross F, it gives you a smaller number even though you're applying the force at the same place, 
There is now an angle an, between those that is not, they're, they're no longer perpendicular. So in general, for a cross product, the magnitude of a cross product is equal to the magnitudes of the two vectors times the sine of the angle between them. So if two vectors are perpendicular, you have the maximum, the, the cross product has its maximum. If two ve vectors are not perpendicular, it's less than that. So when you apply a force, which is, um, which is not perpendicular to the moment arm, you don't get as much rotation. And if you apply the force along the axis, you don't get any, um, any torque. You get no angular acceleration from a torque lined up like that, parallel to the axis. Okay, the torque is perpendicular to the plane defined by the moment arm and the force, and its direction is determined by the right-hand rule. So, switching our, so this is y, and this is x, and then z, so then if I do uh, x cross y, I get z, now, if I take the, so I, I can put the, if I have a moment arm in the xy plane and a force in the xy plane, then r cross f is, no, this is exactly opposite, r cross f is down. I want you to practice the, right-hand rule along with these videos because you actually remember things better if you get up and do them. Um, so use your right hand. Do not use your left hand. It's very sad when you're proctoring an exam. All right. A disc is free to rotate about its axis through the center. The magnitude of the, to of the torque on the disc is RF sine theta. When theta equals zero, the torque is zero and the disc does not rotate. So you're always applying a uh, you're always applying the force. Um, if you so when the torque is ninety degrees, so sorry, when uh, theta is equal to ninety degrees. So if your force is like this, you get no rotation because the torque and the moment arm in that case are parallel. Therefore, the cross product is zero. When your force is perpendicular to the moment arm, you get the maximum torque. So here you, can ha you have an, a few examples of four forces producing torques. Um, and we will, have the, we will calculate the torque about the, the origin for a couple of them. I, let's see. So then we can, we can calculate the magnitude. Four equals R cross F. So here, we are going to call this one, this two, this one is three, and this one is four. And we're going to work our way through these. So first one. In this case, the moment arm, R, the, so the direction from the origin to that, ax, that, um, that point, it is at negative 3 y hat. And the force is equal to 20 newtons in the negative x hat direction. Now, r hat cross f hat is pointing towards me. I can also um, do 4 equals r cross f, which is equal to 60 
y hat cross x hat. x hat cross y hat is z hat, so this is a negative z hat. In general, when you have cross products, when they follow alphabetical order, um, x hat cross y hat is z hat, um, y hat cross z hat is x hat, and z hat cross x hat is y hat. When you have reverse alphabetical order, y hat cross x hat is negative z hat, um, and x hat cross z hat hat is negative y hat, and z hat cross y hat is negative x hat. So if they go in alphabetical order, it's positive. If it's, in, if, if it's reverse alphabetical order, it's negative. All right, number two, I have r equals four x hat, ah, and this in units, this is meter newtons, or newton meters, or joules. I'm going to put the units on at the very end. So R is 4 x hat and uh, 4 meters x hat, and the force is 40 newtons y hat. So now I have the torque is... 160 newton meters x hat cross y hat is a positive z hat. Number three. Now, here I'm going to be a little bit, a little bit careful. I'm only going to calculate the magnitude of the torque. Um, I can, well, actually, I can get the direction. I can get the direction graphically because now I have this is my R hat, or my R. So R cross N is pointing, let's see, I need X cross Y is into the board. So this is R cross N is into the board, so that's still Z hat. I think it should be, ah, yes, because it's a negative, there's a negative component to the, to the X direction. All right, so this is then one meter times 20 newtons times the sign between, so the angle between those two vectors is actually 30 degrees because 60 degrees is the angle that it makes with the x-axis. So sine of 30 degrees, and this is in the z-hat direction. Notice that all of these are going to be in the z hat direction, positive or negative z hat, because it has to be in the plane perpendicular to the force and the um, the force in the moment arm. All right, now our r for number four is five meters, and in the uh, negative x hat direction. And now I have torque equals 5 meters times 30 newtons, 150 newton meters. And it is R, I'm still going to be doing, I'm always rotating that way, so I'm always going to have the, so here I have another Z, positive Z hat. Okay. So that's how you do it. Do practice along with the video. Make sure that you are getting good practicing with that, um, with the right hand rule. 
I recommend while you're working on problems at home that you come up with some memetic, uh, some device that helps you do the cross product. You can also, you can tape three pencils together and, um, and set it up so that it can help you with cross products. That also helps you visualize it. And we know from pedagogical studies that people learn better when they, um, when they do things. Most people learn really well if they're tactile, if they're doing something tactile. So if you physically do it, it's going to stick in your head a little bit better. OK, so three forces acting on a flywheel. The one that is, so your moment arm is different depending on where you are along the flywheel. So here, this is your moment arm. It is parallel to the force. It is not going to create any torque. This one, th this moment arm has a component which is, the force has a component which is perpendicular to the moment arm. So it is, in fact, going to cause rotation. And this one is going to cause the maximum rotation because the force is roughly perpendicular to the moment arm. So where you act on, uh, on the object that you're rotating is going to influence how much it starts rotating. All right, a ship runs aground and tilts, requiring torque to be applied to return the vessel to an upright position. So here, uh, now you're rotating it about this point. You, if you apply the force here, note that um, your torque is larger if your moment arm, for the same force, the torque is larger if your moment arm is larger. So you don't have to apply as much force to cause the same amount of rotation if you apply it further out. All right. So here, R cross F. That's pointing towards me. You're applying this force. Um, here, this says that your, your angle is 10 degrees. Um, and that is 10 degrees relative to the y-axis. So the moment arm and the force are actually, um, the moment arm and the force are at an 80 degree angle relative to each other. So what is the magnitude of the torque produced? It is 100 meters times 5 times 10 to the fifth newtons, and then times sine of 80 degrees. And that's the torque. Okay, an object is supported by a horizontal frictionless table and is attached to a, um, is attached to a pivot point by a cord that supplies centripetal force. A force is applied to the object perpendicular to the radius R, causing it to accelerate about the pivot point. The force is perpendicular to R. So this is going to lead to you, uh, excuse me, I keep using my right hand rule, but my left, my left hand looks like, uh, my right hand looks like my left hand, so I have to use my left hand to do the video. Okay, so then you're applying some force, you're getting it to rotate. A father pushes a playground, playground merry-go-round at its edge and perpendicular to its axis to, re to reach maximum torque. That's because the definition of torque is R cross F. The further you are out from the center, the less force you have to apply. And also, if you apply your force perpendicular um, to the moment arm, you don't have to apply as much force. A rigid body rotates through an angle A to, from A to B <clears throat> by the action of an external force at point P. Now, if it's a rigid body here, this is not a, um, you can't treat it as a point. You have to consider the moment of inertia. And you're applying, uh, so you apply a force 
at P and you have some component which is actually parallel to the Bowman arm and some component perpendicular, the only one that causes rotation is the component perpendicular to the moment arm. Now we can move to kinematic problems. So just like we had kinematic equations for, um, for linear motion, we, can, we have analogous equations for, the, um, for rotational motion. So we had, before we had x final equals x initial plus v initial t plus one half a t squared. Now we have theta final equals theta initial plus the angular velocity time initial times time plus one half alpha t squared. Before we had v and final equals v initial times t plus the acceleration times t. Now we have the final angular velocity is equal to the initial angular velocity plus the angular acceleration times time. We also had v final squared equals v initial squared plus 2a two, uh, two delta x. Now we have omega final squared equals omega initial squared plus 2 alpha delta theta. Before we had f equals ma. Now we have torque equals i alpha. So again, we will, just like when we were working with free body diagrams, we figure out all of the forces. Now we can also figure out all of the torques. And when we have the torques, um, we can when we have the total torque, we can figure out how an object rotates. And then we can calculate how it rotates over all time. A lot of these problems are, so this is, physics is really problem solving, figuring out how to describe the world mathematically. So you have to read the problems very carefully. Make sure that you are converting the words in the problem to equations and mathematical definitions accurately. That's actually the biggest point where people trip up on these problems is converting the problem into some mathematical um, equation. All right. A string is wrapped around a free body, uh, around a pulley of radius r. <clears throat> And then here you have the free body diagram. So you have tension acting on the pulley. Um, and we're assuming that the center of mass of the pulley is at the center. So you have friction apply, applied out here that is going to cause it to rotate. You also have gravity and some force of the, um, of the axle, where the axle is, um, is hooked into some support from the ceiling. All right, so here you have a rod which is rotating. It has um, two beads on it. Um, and then what is the one at 10 centimeters from the axis and one they're fixed, one at 10 centimeters, one at 20 centimeters. What is the um, instantaneous angular velocity of the rod at a given time, and what is the acceleration, angular acceleration of the rod? Um, and then what are the tangential accelerations and um, tangential accelerations? Okay, so if we say, so this it leaves, I left this as an open question. So if we have the angular velocity of, or the angular position of the bead, if that is going to um, equal the initial position plus omega times time and we will um, we will throw in an alpha now 
So this is basically some general equation. What is the instantaneous angular velocity of the rod at that time? That is the derivative of this. We also have our, so the angular, we'll call this W naught. The angular velocity is W naught plus alpha P. And it's the same angular velocity for both beads. Um, the, the beads and the, the rod all have the same angular velocity because the angular velocity is telling you how many radians it's sweeping out per second. Uh, so everything has the same angular velocity. What is the angular acceleration? The angular acceleration is alpha. And the angular acceleration is alpha for all objects, for the rod for, and for both beads. Here's where it gets different. What are the tangential speeds of the beads at the time? So the tangential speed is equal to the radius uh, times the angular velocity. So the angular speed of, the, of this bead is twice as large as the angular speed, or sorry, is the Sorry, the uh, tangential speed is twice as large for this speed as it is for this speed. And what are the tangential accelerations? So the uh, acceleration is equal to r alpha. So again, the tangential, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the tangential acceleration is twice for this speed of what it is for that speed. So the angular acceleration and the angular velocity is the same for everything, but the tangential speed and the tangential velocity varies depending on whether you're talking, by a factor of two, depending on whether you're talking about the bead at 10 centimeters or the bead at 20 centimeters. This is a plot of the angular velocity as a function of time for a fan on a hovercraft. So what is the angle... Okay, so this is asking what is the angle of, through which the blade, blade rotates um, in the first eight seconds. Now this is, I want to note here, watch your unit. So read your problems very carefully. This is given to you in revolutions per minute. So that's not radians per second, which is what we usually use. Revolutions per minute. If we ask, so how many in the eight first eight seconds, there's 400 revolutions per, uh, per minute. Um, and uh, actually here, I'm gonna write this out. So the slope is the angular velocity, uh, the angular acceleration, sorry about that. The angular velocity starts at zero. The angular, so W naught is equal to zero. Alpha, in eight seconds, we go from zero to 400 revolutions per second. So alpha is 400 over eight revolutions per minute. So this is... 50, oh, and then this is, oh, this is, sorry, I got all sorts of units going on here. This is 1 over 8 seconds times 400 revolutions per minute. There are 2 pi radians per revolution. And there are 60 seconds in a minute. And here, I can cancel out my units. So minutes cancel out. Oh, the seconds do not cancel out. That was a mistake. So seconds are still there, but revolutions cancel out, and I am left with radians per second squared. To work out the numbers, I have 400 times 2 times pi over 8 
times 60. Uh, let's see, I can first cancel out 400 divided by 8 leaves me with 50 times 2 is 100 over 60. So I have 100 over 60 pi. And then this is 6 tenths or 10 sixths or five thirds pi. So I am left with five thirds pi radians per second squared. Then, how, what is the angle through which the fan blades rotate in the first eight seconds? I can calculate, I'll leave it in radians. Um, so here, theta equals theta naught plus omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. I start at zero, my initial angular velocity is zero. And I am left with one half alpha t squared. So I have one half five thirds pi sixty four radians per second squared times seconds squared. And I can't do a ton of cancellations. 64 divided by 2 is 32. So I have 32 times 5, which is 160. So I have 160 over 3 pi radians. And that's how many radians I um, go through in 8 seconds. We can do this an another way and calculate the area under the curve because this is actually omega um, as a function of time. And the integral of omega as a function of time which should give you theta. Now I'm going to have to do my unit conversions again. So here, if I just graphically calculate theta, it is going to be 400 revolutions per minute times 8 seconds. Now I have to convert my revolutions per minute again. So I have 2 pi radians per revolution and 60 seconds per minute. Very similar to what I had done before. Um, so I'm redoing some of the same steps. I'm going to cancel out my units, minutes, minutes, revolutions, revolutions. Now I have seconds canceling out, and I am left with radians. Hallelujah, I should be left with radians. Now I have, here I'm dividing by 60. So 400 divided by 60 leaves me with 40 divided by 6, or 20 divided by 3, times 8 times 2 pi radians. And this is, I must have a factor, I have a factor of 2 mistake somewhere. Because this would give me 160. So, forty divided twenty divided by three, that one is correct. I my three is let's see eight fifty one hundred divided by 60, and then here, 
Oh, it's easy. This is length times height, and then I have a triangle, so I have to multiply by one half. I forgot to multiply by one half at the end. So indeed, I am left with 160 pi radians over 3. Either way I do it, whether I do it graphically or whether I use my kinematic equations. Principle of physics. If you do the same problem multiple different ways, you should, if you do it correctly multiple different ways, you should get the same answer. If you do it incorrectly multiple different ways, you might get the same answer, but most of the time you don't. That's why it's often good to look at problems in multiple different ways and make sure that, uh, that you get the same answer either way. And a shortcut to doing this without having to do every problem twice is to work in a study group and work independently, but then check each other's answers at the end. So here you can take the, the old equations that you're hopefully comfortable with by now, the kinematic equations for describing um, projectile motion. They work for angular acceleration as well. And we move on to some examples. A system of particles is shown in the following figure. Each particle has mass m, and they all lie in the same plane. What is the moment of inertia of the system about the given axis? All right. So We're going to draw our coordinate system. Now, the moment of inertia is not actually dependent on the coordinate system, but I always like to have a coordinate system to guide me. OK, we're going to call this theta, leave it general. And we have one two, three. Okay, moment of inertia is equal to the sum of m r squared for each particle. So our moment of inertia here is m r one squared plus m, uh, m one r one squared plus m two r two 2 squared plus, now here, there's an angle theta. It's a moment of inertia. It doesn't matter what the angle is. It only depends on the distance between the, moment, between the point and the axis. So let's say that each particle is 100 grams, just for argument. And then we would have 100 grams times 20 centimeters squared plus 100 grams times 40 centimeters squared plus 100 grams times 60 centimeters squared. So if you have a problem like this, you're given points, calculate the moment of inertia. Um, you just start with the definition for point particles, plow on through until you're done. Most of the problems would, well, some problems have numbers and some ask you to leave it symbolic. All right, a system with two disks, um, so there's a closed disc and then uh, so a disc of, of radius 50 centimeters and then a thin annular region um, and it tells you that the large the large cylinder has mass one kilogram and the inner one uh, sorry, the larger disc has a mass of 2 kilograms, and the smaller disc, that is illegible, the smaller disc has a mass of 
one kilogram. So this guy is two kilograms and this guy is one kilogram. For a disk about its, its center of mass, mass, the moment of inertia is one half times the mass times the radius squared. We can add up the moments of inertia. We can also subtract them. So I can get the moment of inertia of this thin annular region by taking the moment of inertia of a disk of radius 30 centimeters and subtracting off the moment of inertia of a disk of, of radius 20 centimeters. So my moment of inertia is equal to for the, the larger disk, two kilograms divided by, let's see, can I make any, uh, it's probably not, oh, I actually do need to be careful with the disk because I'm given the total mass of the disk, I have to assume, so if I assume uniform, the, the first part is easy. For the large outer disk, my moment of inertia is one half times two kilograms times half a meter quantity squared. So this gives me 0.25. So I'm left with, and here my twos cancel out, so I'm left with 0.25 kilogram meters squared. For this one, let me assume, so I have, let's assume a constant density. Um, for my inner negative disk and my outer disk. So the total mass of my density if I calculate the area the area of the outer cylinder minus the inner cylinder is pi r outer squared minus r inner squared. So if I had the moment of inertia of the So my, dens my density per unit area is the total mass divided by pi r outer squared minus r inner squared. And now the moment of inertia of the inner disk is equal to the mass is equal to the density times the area, which is pi r inner squared, which is one half times the mass times right, one half times the density times the area that gives me this much gives me the mass and then times the radius of that inner disk squared so I get an r inner to the fourth and my pi's cancel out so I am left with m r inner to the fourth over two r outer squared minus r inner squared. Now, this has the correct units. 
uh, it should have units of mass times radius, uh, net mass times distance squared. So I have mass times distance to the fourth divided by distance squared. Now, the moment of inertia of the outer sphere is one half m, the same thing, except that now here I'm changing my in to out. So the moment of inertia of the disk is equal to I out minus I in. So I can think of this as cutting a, a negative disk. And that is equal to M over 2 R outer to the fourth minus r inner to the fourth over r outer squared minus r inner squared. So my total moment of inertia, I'm gonna call this, I'm gonna call this ring, not disc. And this is I disc. So and then here I can plug in, this one plugging in numbers is a, I can't take a fourth power. So my total moment of inertia would be this thing plus that thing. And to get an actual number, you'd have to plug in, I'm not going to plug in the numbers. That is left as an exercise for the student. So here, now note that you could also do this um, using integrals. So if you're comfortable using integrals, it might actually be easier to calculate the moment of inertia of the disk by doing integrals than to calculate the moment of inertia of the disk by taking, by using the, or sorry, of the ring by, the, by using the disk solution. All right. A uniform rod of mass one kilogram and length two meters is free to rotate about one end. Um, if the rod is released from rest at, an, at a certain angle, what is the speed of the tip of the rod as it passes the horizontal position? Okay, this, is, this one involves putting a lot of different things together. So um, here, first of all, have the center of mass. Well, we don't, I think we don't need the center of mass. Let's get the moment of inertia. This is a rod rotating about its end. We did that one already. So the moment of inertia of this rod is one third times mass times the length uh, squared. I put a two, but I said a three. One third ml squared. All right. Now, um, there is a torque here. So the torque, the force, is going to be that marker, this marker again. Now the force is equal to mg. However, the angle changes. So the torque actually changes with the, the angle. Our torque is like the, our force, let's see, sorry about that. Our force is, we can act as if it's at the center. So it's acting at the center and it is mg. And just for good measure, I'm going to um, put a coordinate system on here. So we have x and y. And now our weight is mg in the negative y direction. 
and that's, gonna, that's always going to be the angle, the moment arm is going to change. I use that. Let me, let me use consistently a capital M, negative MG. The torque is going to be the force, MG, times the moment arm, L over 2, then sine of the magnitude of the torque is sine of the angle between them. Now, the angle between them, if this is 60, this is going to be, so this is theta, and this is 90 minus theta. So the angle between those two, the force and the moment arm is 90 minus theta. So theta changes. And this asks, if the rod is released at a certain angle, what is the speed of the tip of the rod as it passes the horizontal position? So torque is equal to moment of inertia alpha. So our alpha actually depends on, on theta. This one you would have to, to get it as a function of all time, you would have to, I believe you would have to solve it numerically. But you could figure out, so because your torque changes, all right, so we'll leave that one you would have to figure out how you could, yeah, you'd have to set it up and I think you would have to solve it because the derivative of the, um, of the angle depends, uh, the second derivative depends on the angle. That would be a little bit of a tricky one to solve in this class. You could figure out through energy conservation what happens, ah, that's the way you would do it. You would do it for energy conservation. Um, here, your kinetic energy is zero. And so, so at the beginning, we have, I didn't put it up on the board, but we actually have, uh, we have energy equations for kinetic energy due to rotation. Before, we had one-half mv squared. Now we have one-half i um, omega squared. So... Our initial kinetic energy, let's see, here we are at L over 2, and we use X and Y. Um, the height of the, um, so initially we have some potential energy. Um, our potential energy initial is equal to L over 2 and then this is cosine, that's sine. L over 2 is sine theta. So we have some initial potential energy uh, times mg. So this is gravitational potential energy at the beginning. At the end, our gravitational potential energy is zero. And, but at the end, we have some kinetic rotational, we have some rotational energy. So our final kinetic energy is one half I, now for the, this particular configuration, I is M 
L squared over 3, and then omega squared. So if we start at rest, m g l over 2 sine theta equals m l. I've now make all of my m's lowercase. m l g over uh, Initial potential energy equals final. Everything is now in, in the final position. Everything is in kinetic energy. So now I can cancel some things out. My M's. I can cancel out 1L. And I get... So I can move the 6 over there, 3g sine theta equals omega squared. So I can calculate, so what is the speed of the tip of the rod? Um, so if omega equals the square root of 3g sine theta, then the speed is equal to the moment arm times the angular velocity. The moment arm at the tip is L. So I have L times 3G sine theta. You could even use energy conservation to answer this more generally to figure out what is the angular velocity as a function of theta. So I can write m g l over 2 sine theta initial equals m g l over 2 sine theta final plus this one simplifies to m l squared over 6 omega squared I'm going to multiply through by a 2. And then multiply through by a 6. By a six. Now, does that save me much? No, I'm going to multiply through by 3 after that. Sorry. So I am left with 3 g sine theta initial minus sine theta final uh, here I dropped an L I should have a G over L I should end up with units of second inverse second squared here and this is meters per second squared those units those units will help you every time so here 3g over l equals omega squared so that's more general now solving this exactly is tricky because this is actually d theta dt. So you have d theta dt squared as a function of theta squared. So that would be or as a function of sine of theta. So that would be a differential equation that you would have to solve. So solving it exactly um, for all time is really complicated. You can't do it. So you can't answer this question using kinematic equations alone. If you have to, if you want to answer this question, then you have to, uh, you have to use energy conservation. That's one of the reasons it's really important to have energy conservation as well as the kinematic equations in your toolkit because you can't answer every, you can't, 
solve every problem with the same tools. So you got to have all the tools at your disposal. All right. A solid sphere of radius 10 centimeters is allowed to rotate freely about an axis. The sphere is given a sharp blow so that its center of mass starts from the position shown in the following figure with a speed of 5 centimeters per second. What is the maximum angle that the diameter makes with the, the vertical? Okay, we're going to set this one up. But I'm going to leave it. Um, I'm not going to solve it all the way. So again, this one, you're going to have to use, um, use energy conservation. So at the beginning, uh, so here you have, uh, it, it starts with a speed of 15 centimeters per second. So initially, your kinetic energy is all translational. So you have one half m v initial squared and you can think of that so that's rotating about that's causing it to rotate about the axis um, but at the end you don't have um, you only have rotational kinetic energy so you need one half i i would have to look up the mo i believe that is two-fifths m r squared and then um, ah sorry wait a minute this is what is it what does it have at the end at the end it actually only has potential energy so you have the so if you start with zero potential energy here and you have some slight potential energy there, your potential energy is equal to the total mass times G times the radius minus the radius. So how much is that height? And then... Cosine of theta because if we have so it's this is R. So this is R cosine theta. Yep. So MGR cosine theta. And then you have energy conservation. So you can solve this from this to figure out what the maximum, uh, so at what the maximum angle is. Because at the point that you only have potential energy, then uh, you are at the maximum angle. All right. Two flywheels of negligible mass and different radii are bonded together and rotate on a common axis. The smaller flywheel has a cord pulling with a force of five newtons on it. What force, um, what force needs to be applied to the connecting, cord connecting the larger flywheel so that the combination does not rotate? All right, if the, um, if the flywheels have negligible um, masses, then the only thing that you need to balance is the torques. So the magnitude of the first torque times the first force. So these are going to apply torques in different directions. So here you have R and F. So R cross F is towards me. Here you have R and F, so R cross F is away from me. The torques are in opposite directions. Um, so the net torque, I'm going to, the net torque is the first torque minus the second torque. And to have the two, to have the system at 
not rotate, you need the net torque to be zero. So the um, second force is equal to R1 force 1 over R2. So the first radius, the, the smaller radius is 30 centimeters, and the larger radius is 50 centimeters, and the force is 50 newtons. So to stop the rotation, you need, to prevent rotation, you need a force of 30 newtons. Note here how sometimes these problems have nice, neat numbers. In general, when you're working a problem in an intro physics text and the numbers get really hairy and ugly, you probably have done something wrong. So it's worth considering whether or not you're, you've done, what, whether you've made a mistake. Now, if you're working a problem that I created, Coming up with problems that have nice, neat numbers is really tricky. So if you're working one of my problems and the numbers aren't even, it could just be that I couldn't get the numbers to work out neatly. But it never hurts to ask, especially on homework problems. OK, so a hanging mass must be placed on the cord to keep the pulley from rotating. The mass, uh, the mass on the frictionless plane is 5 kilograms. The inner radius of the pulley is 20 centimeters, and the or what hanging mass has to be placed to keep the pulley from rotating? Um, so now you are uh, here. You here. I didn't translate enough. It matters where you're applying the forces. So there's you, what you would have to do here is figure out the. Um, you have a torque acting here. Um, so you have R, let me draw the picture a little larger. Here you have tension and force, and then you also have tension acting, you have a force acting down, and, ah, and it is directly down, but, so your force is applied here, ah, and that's by definition also going to be a moment arm of this. So what's missing from how I transcribe, trans let's see, this, is, this should not say force, that is the moment arm up there. Um, what's missing from this problem is that you are applying the torques at two different radii. And I didn't say which radii they are, but it's the same problem. You're going to say, well, torque one, the, the net torque, has to equal zero, and one force supplies a torque in one direction, and the other torque supplies a torque in the other direction. So how do you get, um, how do you keep the pulley from rotating? You keep the pulley from rotating by applying the same torque to both. If the pulley doesn't rotate, the masses don't slide. So you'd have to figure out the tension in the string here. The tricky part is that the tension, the tension here is equal to the mass, uh, is equal to the weight of this mass. The tension here is not equal to the weight of this mass because, um, because it is a block on an inclined plane. All right, calculate the torque about the z-axis. It is out of the page. Um, I'll set this one up. Um, here you would simply, um, you can simply take your different particles and 
you have two meters x hat cross this one is ah i don't even have the magnitude of the forces so you would have to take for this first this one r cross f this one r cross f this one r cross f and then here the moment arm is zero, so you have no torque. All right, with that, we'll wrap up rotations. Do be careful when you're, um, when you're solving these problems, and please heed my advice. If you've had intro physics and it's been easy to this point, this is probably the chapter that's going to start tripping you up.